Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today, a treat especial, all the way from 35 clicks southwest of Stuttgart and Metabo Flakkopt Winkerschleifel. Made in Germany, just about the centroid of the universe. If you're into fancy German cars, what for impressing the ladies from the local beauty school with vulgar displays of overcompensation. I ain't saying, I got nothing against German cars. I mean, you want to talk about the ladies wearing out your saddle horn? 1979 80 horsepower 3 liter Mercedes diesel. Make your haberdasher rich, what with the big brass clockers it takes to drive five cylinders of raw vegetable oil converted power on the Autobahn. Von, von, von. Driving one of those things on vegetable oil, you might have 50 horsepower. You be steady wearing out the crutch of your dungarees stride and strutting down the market plots, wa? I bought this specific model because it's differente from the rest. See the big gland end on these? How big they are? Now I wouldn't know about this, but apparently it's not the size of the axe, it's how you swing it. As a comparison, the dingle arm end on your typical grind air is going to be about three inches from stem to stern. That's in metric, uh, about three inches. No. Oh. <laughs> if that happens, uh, your dingle arm end falls off, you're probably a little bit too late to go see your physician. And the dingle arm end on the, the flat Panacucan version here is a boot two inches. So that's 33% smaller. That's a lot more poking in the poking bit receptacle. You know what I'm saying? For easing into tight spots. Now I wouldn't know, but I've been told that that extra inch could make the difference between a satisfying job well done and an excruciatingly long hand finish. Oh, here's the Metabo 5 inch, 900 watts. That's over a horsepower. Uh, 746, 747. I just remember 747 watts is one horsepower. So that's over a horsepower in the palm of your hand. And of course, I like the, I prefer the rat tail style. Uh, this is, I don't know what you call that, horse cock style, I guess. And I don't like that because these get worn out and they pop off all the time. But Maybe not. It seems reasonably rigid. Um, that's kind of crappy there. I'm surprised they let that. Yeah. 300 Canadian pesos this thing was. Here we got the training wheels for sissies here. Actually, this will save you if you're ever in a dilly of a pickle. But uh, I've never seen... That's really weird. It seems chintzy to me. But uh, what would you call that? Normally they have a ring. A, uh, keeping with the theme, normally they'd have a, a cock ring on there, what for keeping it stiff. Wait a second. That's actually, wow. Like a German virgin, that. Good and tight. Nicely done. I've never seen so... It's very simple, but very sturdy. But that's an interesting feature. They, they were smart about that. That is a real heavy, heavy detent on that. So that will not go anywhere. And the, the thinking about it, the nice part about that is like on the rat tails, you end up losing this fastener. Frame it, you fuck. You end up losing this fastener. It gets loose and weeble wobbles around and then wears the threads out. So you got to replace the fastener. Good luck finding a metric <laughs> bolt in most places. A midnight raid over to your brother-in-law's Toyota Tercel. Now looking at this tab, it needs to be very robust on account of withstanding the 200 pound gorillas. And this thing is a pro tool. This thing gets a hot supper every day. So they've gone ahead and used steel. But if you look at all the features here, in order to cast this in steel, you'd be, and then, yeah, you wouldn't be able to cast it in steel because the processing afterwards would be so expensive uh, it just you just couldn't do it but the detent in the, on that is so heavy this is centered powder metal so they take a powder different types of metal uh, mainly steel but some copper all sorts of stuff they put it in a mold they squeeze it and then they cook it but they don't actually melt it they cook it at a high enough temperature for long enough that the grains grow together powdered metal gear it uh, has revolutionized how complex and cheap we can make parts like this and in this application uh, I mean it lasts longer than you a nice power cord of course it's a double insulated tool so we don't have the third prong for what for the grounding 
And this cord, real nice cord, Refang, I don't know that brand, it sounds a little bit offshore to me, but 16 American wire gauge, so lots of copper in there. 105C, that's really good insulation. I'm feeling this insulation. It feels like natural rubber. It, uh, it feels just like trailing cable on a piece of mining gear or a, a port crane. That real high quality, and that's an interesting process. Uh, that, that's super expensive to do that because they actually take natural rubber and they have to they put in different uh, components to it for abrasion resistance and for coloring and then it has to be kneaded and actually the cords get twisted together they, they, they'll buy the electrical builders wire together it'll get twisted together and it'll get shot out of a die but the thing is with natural rubber in order for it to vulcanize it needs heat and pressure it also needs pressure so what they do is as this is extruded from a die I know at least for the big cable this is what they do they actually also at the same time extrude solid lead around this jacket and that compresses this so that when they put it in an autoclave an autoclave is essentially a pressure cooker where they um, just steam everything under pressure so it's a big huge hot pressure vessel uh, a lot of energy in there so there's some safety involved but this will be jacketed in the lead and after they cook it the rubber has been vulcanized and they have to go ahead and take all the lead off and then remelt it and reuse it it's a whole process and it makes it extremely expensive so if indeed this is natural rubber which it sure as hell feels like to me and is indicative of this 105 c this is one hell of a cord man and plenty of it now natural rubber cannot be beat especially in the cold and say you're doing a meth lab in guadalajara well they're not going to melt into nothing because the molecules of the rubber actually have been cross-linked by the sulfur compounds in there and once they're vulcanized they don't you can't remelt them it's it's completely changed so unlike a thermoset plastic which you can melt uh, this won't do that so these rubber compounds are the material of choice for abrasion resistant and height you know sparks in the industry in general uh, mining whatever this is where it's at and the reason they don't use them in other tools is because it's too expensive but when you buy a $300 grinder it comes with a good poking end now we're just into the back side of it and already some surprises some good some nasty this uh, glass fiber reinforced PA6 of course is nylon and She's nice and stiff because it's thick. So they haven't chinsed out on how much material they actually put in there. That is beefy. And I like this feature where the slots for the cooling are actually recessed. They're shielded so you, you have a hard time breaking those um, guards there. So that's, that's a smart feature. This is weird though. Urethane open cell urethane foam. A little... A little pocket of it here I guess just for keeping the rattle trap effect down on the wires but this is not very good at uh, heat like it can't handle a lot of heat so it's funny that it's in here right by the commutators and the brushes now looking at this design this urethane is not the correct material as I said it's open cells probably about two pound per cubic uh, foot density the problem is this would be right full of this would be right full of bromine uh, so it doesn't so it's flame retardant but there's nothing to protect it from the uv from the uh arcing and the sparking of the commutation and this is only good like not normal urethane it's only good to about 85 100 degrees uh centigrade so this is you know it's gonna get hot in here man this I would be willing to bet if this if this got put into service for six months you open this up and this would be powder and we flip this over we got some interesting stuff going on here not only do we have the switch actuated again through a glass fiber 30 percent uh, nylon bar but we also have some electronical doodads and they're all potted in they're potted in uh, epoxy this would be a urethane epoxy as well we can see here's a big resistor in here and some other stuff it almost looks like trim pots 
So we'll have to have a look at that if we can and see what the hell's going on. I don't know why they would have that because, uh, you know, oh, you, you want the grinder just off and on unless this is some sort of a triac, which is like an easy start or a, a soft start. Well, from what I can glean from the manual, this is overload protection. Now, when this gets too hot, it still allows you to run, but you're supposed to just idle it down until it can until it can cool itself off. So this has to be, I don't know if it would be electronic or just uh, dumb kind of thermistors or something. Now, having a look at the brush assemblies, beautiful, nice big brush assemblies with uh, brass. Of course, brass is really good at heat transfer and not bad at uh, passing electrical pixies. Now the brushes themselves are interesting. They have this feature you see here. And what for that is, is once you get to a certain wear area, it starts to arc and spark and you lose power. And I would assume that as you wear the brush even more, the girth of this rod isn't enough. If you stop on the wrong spot, the thing actually won't commutate. Uh, it'll just sit there and I assume so that is an interesting feature to prevent you from wearing the brushes all the way out and uh, damaging the motor rotor or rather the commutator ring. And you can see from the pattern on the copper bars that the brush is serrated. That's new. We see that all the time now in tools. We didn't see that say 10 years ago, but that is for wear in and proper seating. Uh, we can see here that it's wiped a nice pattern on the bars. That means that Yes, they have actually tested this before they packaged it up and sent it to the Great White North, so that's always good to know. Now, I just got the main connections off at the switch. Of course, the switch is what fails the most because it's what connects the 200-pound gorilla with the rest of the system. So it's what fails most. We got on the cord here some nice stake-ons. These are, are ferrules, uh, brass ferrules, to contain all the, the little strands of wire. Uh, kind of surprised to see with this high-end wire that it's not tinned. Each conductor is not tinned, and that prevents corrosion, of course. That's a, a feature you will see on any kind of rated shipboard cable or any high-end cable. It'll always be tinned, so it, has, uh, it doesn't get oxidized as easily. But this is a weird arrangement, the way they've got this. They, they have this little round stake on, and then they, they've got this spade connector here with a ring terminal and look at this just a weeble wobbling in the breeze not even yeah that's horrific horrific that's no good really terrible uh, and it's terrible because it's it's not even on there solidly it's just kind of weeble wobbling around so that's if it works now it's not gonna work for very long now even worse this is the terminal with this chintzy urethane foam on it. Now you get a loose connection like that, what's that mean? You get high resistance, you get high resistance, you get high temperature. That is not a good thing. In fact, it's a very bad thing. Just maybe that's why they have some odd coating on there because they want that to be loose and then it'll micro weld or, or some magic stuff. But anytime you come across an electrical connection and it's loosey goosey like that, you fix it because it's NFG. It just, you're asking for trouble. Loose connections are not good. Now what, why they've gone and, and done this to where it doesn't stake on properly. Here's a disconcerting juxtaposition here. This is all loosey-goosey. And then on the motor stator, they've gone for the connections and actually they've gone through the trouble of actually adding hot snot impregnated or hot snot filled uh, shrink tubing just to beef up that connection. If you check all the other connections, none of them are loosey-goosey. So, what the F, yo. Here we get to the switch. It has a nice, robust snap action. And interesting feature on the side, they've added a little capacitor. It looks like 1.5 or 15 microfarad capacitor. And it's across the terminals of the switch. So that must be for not noise suppression because if it was noise suppression they would want it closer to as close as possible to the motor not on the switch so it's got to be to eliminate the sparking or reduce the amount of arcing when the contacts make and break so that's a nice feature just a little detail 
to try and make this switch actually last longer. And the way they made the electrical connection, hey, you read my mind, is uh, interesting. Look at this. So they've got the stake on terminals for the switch and they've just gone and taken one of the leads and put it in there and then uh, <laughs> crimped them together. And then interestingly, on the other side, a whole bunch of high temperature celastic some sort of, yeah, silicon putty stuff to, to keep it in, just schmoo to keep it in place. But, uh, yeah, that's interesting, air quotes. Now look at this, fit, finish, and hand feel make a big difference to the longevity of a tool because if it feels like a piece of junk, you're going to consider it a piece of junk. Then you have any problems really, you're just going to chuck it out because it's a piece of junk. But look at the fit and finish on this switch. Weeble wobbles all over the way. It doesn't inspire confidence. We see what's going on here. Is that just gets clipped in plastic clips. Focus, you fuck. There we go. You see that? So that's manufactured for ease of assembly. Not longevity. And those are just the little plastic clips that, that pop in there. I wonder if I can... Yeah, look at that. It doesn't feel nice. Uh, getting into the mechanicals, and I see a real weak point here. This is likely what breaks first. And it has to do with the guard. If you look at this, you have this big heavy detent spring. And this fairly robust looking uh, nylon glass impregnated, you know, yada yada yada. Nice and strong, just as strong as cast aluminum. Uh, however, if you look at how it gets affixed, there's not much meat there, man. Very little meat across here. So, picture it, 200 pound gorilla, finished at the end of the day, every day drops this. This has got a tweak, you know, he drops it on the table, this tweaks over. This has to withhold all that impact. So it has to be fairly impact resistant. And there's not enough meat there in order to do that. So, you will be replacing this, no doubt, before anything else. I was just going to try and get into the meat of her here, but I ended up pulling the whole rotor out. The fan shroud assembly. Just for airflow, I won't worry about that right now. And that's uh, pretty cool, but I wonder if this is belt drive or there's a shaft or something in here. You see how long that is. There has to be some sort of power transmission thing going on in there. Big long pinion maybe. Whoa! That's a new one. Lovejoy coupling. Strange. Wow, what the fuck? What the, oh, it's even got a spider. Wow, that's a real soft elastomer, elastomometer, elastomometer, fuck it. I usually use WD-40 on aluminum parts, but whenever I come across like haunted parts or parts of demonic origin, I like to break out the special formulation. All the help I can get. Now I'm not sure if this move here is ballsy or stupid, but a more smart person than I may have bolted this thing together. Hello? You got your what in the vise? That's cool though, that's... That's like a little bit of a, that little condom there is a bit of a shock absorber. Wow, man. We've never seen, yeah, never seen anything like that in a, normally it's just straight pinion right onto the crown gear. I see now because this is longer, it has to, they have to make accommodations for that. 
And what they've done is the bearing housing actually isn't built into here because they need to be able to install this big female uh, coupling half. So what they've actually done is they've cast, die cast and machined another bearing housing. And I can see the bearing in there. I'm quite surprised it's, it's a sealed bearing. It was just a Chinese 608 little flea bay bearing. Uh, I would have thought in a $300 machine you'd, you'd get some SKFs or something, some name brand at least. Same thing on the back side. Just uh, nothing special. Shielded bearing, of course, shield uh, on the back side. You're going to get lots of dust in there from the commutator. But there is a little shock absorber, a little uh, nitrile rubber shock absorber on the back. And of course, there is accommodation here. This hard UV resistant plastic, what for, I don't know, separating the brushes from the bearing itself. And the motor rotor looks nice and skookum. They've gone and epoxied everything in. Of course, it would be magnet wire, so it would be lacquer or some sort of polyurethane uh, dielectric coating on the wire itself. And then they've gone and dipped it in another epoxy. And then they've also added, in addition to that, another epoxy and then a layer of, looks like polyethylene, some sort of tape, maybe even clear. I don't know if they can make clear Captain tape, but there is some sort of plastic over top of that. That would have to be fairly robust in uh, thermal properties because this thing's going to get hot, but that well balanced. I mean, they, they spared no uh, expense at the grinding wheel. Now this coupling is just interference fit on the shaft. So we never get that off unless we pulled it off or heated it up. And essentially the shaft is dimensionally the same diameter as the inside diameter, the ID of this, or maybe even a little bit bigger. And we heat this up. We heat it differentially and that means it, it expands differentially. So if this is room temperature and we heat this up, it expands. We slide it on and then let it cool down. And then all of a sudden it's on there better than a weld. It's essentially the same piece of metal. So in order to get that off, chances are we'd have to break that. And we need to get that off in order to take the bearing. Well, maybe not. Let me try. Let me see if I can't break something. You know, there's nothing really to pry on because the fan is uh, that PA6 glass fiber reinforced. And yeah, it'll just break. So we actually need to get a, a bearing splitter in behind there and then jack on this shaft and pull this off. But I'm not going to do that. You can pretty much see this. Uh, it That actually looks like magnesium. It doesn't look like aluminum casting, which doesn't make sense because you'd think they'd be doing it in the same foundry and it would be the same material. Let's just go ahead and check to see if indeed that's magnesium or if it's an aluminum alloy. Now there's a couple ways to do that in the field. One the easiest way is to go to the cook shack and get some vinegar and just check. If there is a reaction, it's magnesium. And if there's no reaction, it's uh, mainly aluminum. So no reaction, mainly aluminum. The other way to do that is to take some shavings, burn it on a piece of paper. If it burns and there's nothing left, just white ash, you know that it was magnesium and you'll be able to see it. Uh, if it just sort of melts away or is still there, you know it's aluminum. I'm going to check the gear ratio here. One, two, three, that's uh, three and seven eighths to one. That's right about where we'd expect it, considering this is turning a little bit slower. It's not 1100, it's uh, 10,000 ripples. So three and seven eighths, 3.875 to one is the gear ratio. I'm removing the pinion and there we go. That's what's going on. It's a shaft. So I've got a couple of bearings. Of course, when you have a long shaft and then this coupling, you need two bearings in order to locate it. Otherwise, it will wobble. This gear, interestingly, yeah, there's no fastener on there at all, but that's actually a machined hob gear. It's not powdered metal. So this would have been machined out of a piece of round stock and then placed on the shaft. There's a lot of assembly going on here, like 
and shrink fit. So these are expensive parts because you need to get the tolerance is perfect so that you get enough of a an interference so the thing actually works. There's yeah, that's an interesting way to do it, kind of costly way to do it. But as I said, this coupling here, this is a powdered metal gear, and on the other end, hauled machined, just a spacer. And that, that is just a punched little spacer in there. So it locates it locates on this shoulder. Now that's interesting because this is a powdered metal gear centered paddle metal gear. The shaft itself is a steel shaft that's machined. Now, hardened metal gear, of course, probably hard as a coffin nail, yeah. Just as hard as ever it could be. So is the pinion, I betcha, yeah. Now, when we looked at the fine, there was, there was a way to change the contact pattern if it wasn't perfect. Now, there's no way to do that in here, and that kind of concerns me because you're you're locating on this scabby looking well this is a pressed part rather this is a punched part and here we have a machine spacer and it's up against a machine so we have one two three machine four machine surfaces that are trying to locate this in the correct contact pattern and there's no shims in order to adjust it if it's not so they're they would have to make either really expensive parts or, you know, to get the, to, to hit those tolerances or, uh, you know, maybe they woke up with a bushel of fucks one morning and uh, by the time they get to work, they would all been given away. Now, as far as the wheel changing mechanism, this is the least amount of meat that we've seen on any grinder. Very little meat there. There's about two millimeters thick by maybe a millimeter and a half of engagement. So 80 thou to to 60 thou. Now this this pin is interesting. It's got an o-ring to keep the grease in and it's a spring loaded. Now you can see this isn't powdered metal and I'll show you why. If you look at just the correct light with your tongue at the right angle you can see the helical chatter mark pattern. So either the tool was getting dull right down here or they're feeding too fast or something going wrong with the uh, machining process. But pretty well you know it doesn't affect the performance but I'm surprised they would let that go and the grease in here just a little dab will do you nothing special though nowhere sticktivity to it I don't even think it's a lithium grease it's too it's super super thin might just be calcium the difference being a uh, lithium drop test is maybe 200 C where it melts and drops out of a ASTM test jig and the Calcium is only a hundred C. I have a feeling this melt pretty low temperature, but uh, yeah Likely the gear itself has some copper impregnating what for helping with the surface wear Helps slide a little bit better, but in the DeWalt like this is doesn't look like anything special uh, In the DeWalt remember we actually had molybdenum disulfide However, the surface finish of that powdered metal gear was way worse than this one. This is actually like a reasonable surface finish. The other one, if you recall, the DeWilt, super, super pitted and, and gnarly. So I think they had to rely on that molybdenum disulfide, uh, those platelets of molybdenum disulfide to, to fill the voids and slide on each other. Overall, fit and finish of this is way nicer, but that does concern me that there is no way to adjust the wear contact or the contact pattern of that gear, especially considering the arrangement that we have here. So I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, Prussian blue, uh, <laughs> the cyanide compound, out and we'll blue this gear and we'll check the contact pattern. Prussian blue, where are you? Well, the Empire of Dirt refused to give up the booty, so we're going to might need to make our own. I'm going to try using just Dicom and uh, my 30-year-old axle grease here, halfway through. Well, it is blue. It is greasy. My friggin' wife, right, sneaking down here in the middle of the night. I tell you, if it's shiny and not bolted down, 
gone. Yeah, no surprise, unfortunately, I suspected because we're dealing with three or four different tolerances, plus it's being retained by a punched steel. You know, you can't maintain tolerances under certain machining conditions and punching steel is, is one of those ones. We can see here, we got good contact. However, let's have a look there. You see that? It goes right to the edge of the gear tooth. So the belly is in the right spot. The belly of the contact is in the right spot, but it goes all the way to the edge of the gear tooth. So you would want to see that belly a little bit further up towards the center and that way you wouldn't be wearing on that very edge of the gear tooth. So you would be able to fix that contact pattern by adding some shims here. That would extend this out and then the pinion would engage and it wouldn't drive the gear tooth all the way through to the edge. It would just do it in the middle. So yeah. Fail. Now the contact pattern on the pinion is great. You can see it doesn't go to the edge, it's right in the middle, but there's lots of room there to uh, extend this guy out. And here's the handle. Ooh, the fancy. You gotta pay more for that Metabo branding. This is just uh, PP polypropylene. Glass fiber reinforced, 30%. And hello, focus, you mother... F Thank you. And SEBS, which is a styrene elastomer butylene styrene so it's uh, a butylene nitrile rubber with uh, styrene on either end of the molecule there and that's that this rubbery stuff so not really good i don't know if you ever well styrene and any kind of industrial solvent yeah no es bueno so uh all this rubber stuff likely if you have one and there's industrial solvents around or any kind of harsh chemicals uh, this will be rotted right out of her all right, we got our A part. We had a good poke at her. We can see now exactly what components are in there, what's lacking and what's good. Does this measure up to the Makita? Absolutely it does. Is it twice the Makita? Because it's twice the price. No, but I will tell you exactly why. If there's some anecdotal uh, comments about these last way longer, I'll tell you exactly why they last longer. This one little component right here. That's the overload. So when you get too much current through the motor or it starts getting hot, this thing will throttle back. You won't get as much power through here. And that's going to allow all of the electricals to cool down, prevent them from burning up. That's the only reason this would last longer because I'll tell you what, this crown gear here, powdered metal gear, not nearly as good as the forged steel gear that's in the Makita. No way. Also, all the connections are all press fit. So they're all interference fit. That means that the tolerances need to be super high. Whereas in, in the newer Makitas and the DeWalt's and yada yada yada, they're all a fastener fit. So it's not as critical to get the same dimensioning on there in order for it to transmit the torque. As far as the castings, you know, the castings are skookum. The bearings, you would think, a nice German tool, 300 Canadian pesos, I can't stress that enough. You know, it's twice the price of a typical rat tail Makita. Chinese bearings, no name, flea bay bearings. Eh. Okay, I forgot to mention the brush holders here. They're on a plastic backing that slides into the slot here. Now, the problem with that is, just like the $20 horror fright, <laughs> grinder that'll melt right out of her now the only thing preventing that of course this has protection in it so they might get away with not melting these brushes right out of her but this protection module is what's protecting this from actually melting in the hands of a 200 pound gorilla if it didn't have this built-in protection this would be not nearly as good as the Makita However, considering that it's twice the price, you know, are you sort of getting a little of the Louis Vuitton scenario here where it's a luxury tool? I think so. I think you're paying for it being made in Germany. So for the home gamer who's not going to do much grinding, go ahead to Harbor Freight and get the heavy duty grinder. 
it's well worth the 20 bucks as long as you don't abuse it. If you're going to do some pro home gamer stuff or some pro stuff, the Makita is your best bet, I would say. In my opinion, I got lots of them, so I'm a little bit biased, but they are the grinder that won the West. And if you own a workshop and you got 200, 300 pound gorillas on there uh, that are burning them out steady, like it's not the trigger or whatever, it's somebody literally like leaning on the thing for too long and lets the smoke out. The Metabo is the way to go because it's got protection and it'll throttle you back. As a home gamer, I can't handle protect like if it starts to smell, you know, well, if I want to finish the cut, I'll finish the fucking cut. You know what I'm saying? But that doesn't always work in industry. You kind of want to protect your investment. However, the proof and the pudding is in the eating. So we're going to get these back together and we're going to test them all electrically at the same time. That is, we're going to put them under load. We'll run them through their paces. We're going to see how hot they get. All sorts of interesting stuff. Might even see if we can let the smoke out of one or two of them. Thanks a lot for watching. Hey, keep your dick in the vice.